North Korea. Over the weekend, Kim Jong-un, North Korean dictator and world's most dangerous rectangle, hosted a surprise military parade where he showed off his brand new missiles and a brand new side of himself. Kim Jong-un apologized for failing to improve North Koreans' lives in an address at an unprecedented pre-dawn military parade. This came out at the climax of a nearly two-hour military parade in the country's capital. The country's leader, Kim Jong-un, was seen crying, along with those in the crowd thanking the North Korean people for their hard work during the pandemic. He got more emotional than I think we've ever seen. He looks like he was standing there at the podium, sobbing. And this went on for quite some time. Wow, guys. This is the day that Kim Jong-un finally became president. I honestly can't believe that Kim Jong-un broke down in tears during a military parade. That's how you know everyone is feeling the pandemic blues. Even a murderous dictator is like, it's too much. It's too, the zoom, all the time in my background and I don't, I don't have a background. Although it's uh, really easy to admit your failures as a leader when it's impossible for anyone to replace you. I mean, it's not like his people can vote him out. You know, it's kind of like when a kidnapper admits that they were wrong. I just wish that this hadn't happened to both of us. Both of us? And look, I don't speak North Korean, so I can't confirm exactly what Kim was saying. But if I had to put my money on it, he was probably saying something like this. But let's move on from the world's most famous dictatorship to the one country that will never become a dictatorship for at least the next three weeks, the United States of America. After RBG's passing, President Trump and his Republican minions wasted no time nominating Judge Amy Coney Barrett, the GOP's final infinity stone to destroy Planned Parenthood. Now, unlike last year's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, Barrett has not been accused of sexual assault or juvenile delinquency or... Wait, what was the other thing? I liked beer. My man. So, if you were planning on watching these hearings, please, don't waste your time. Because over the years, all these hearings have become is each party making big speeches about how the nominee is either gonna save or destroy the Supreme Court, and then the nominee pretending that they have never had a point of view on anything. For example, it's no secret that Amy Coney Barrett is against Roe v. Wade, right? Trump wouldn't have picked her otherwise. But if you ask her about it during the hearing, all of a sudden, she doesn't have an opinion. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? I think on that question, I, you know, I'm gonna invoke Justice Kagan's description, which I think is um, perfectly put. When she was in her confirmation hearing, she said that she was not gonna grade precedent or give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And I think in an area where precedent continues to be pressed and litigated, as is true of Casey, it would be particularly, um, it would actually be wrong and a violation of the canons for me to do that as a sitting judge. It's distressing not to get a straight answer. So let me try again. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? Again, I can't pre-commit or say, yes, I'm going in with some agenda because I'm not. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe can and should be overturned by the Supreme Court? It's a contentious issue, which is, I know, one reason why it would be comforting to you to have an answer, but I can't express views on cases or pre-commit to approaching a case any particular way. Yeah. Democrats spent all day trying to get Barrett to admit that she wants to overturn Roe v. Wade. Basically, the whole day was like, pro-lifer says what? Pardon? Ah, well played. And abortion rights are just one example. Barrett refused to say where she stood on every topic. And I'm not picking on her, by the way. This is what every Supreme Court nominee does, which almost makes you wonder what the point of these hearings is. Seriously, we're like, what are we doing? We all know what she's gonna do. So why do we have to do the whole 
song and dance as if it's a big mystery. How do you feel? We know how she feels. It's like interviewing a toddler to see if they're gonna misbehave after you leave the room. Are you gonna eat the cookie when I leave? I have no opinions on cookies. And are you gonna draw on the walls when I leave? I don't have any opinions on drawing. Well, that works for me. Here's the keys to the house, kid. I'll see you in a week. <laughs> Here's an idea, guys. If we know which judges are liberal and which are conservative, then why don't, why don't we just change the rules to reflect that? Just have four judges picked by Democrats and then four judges picked by conservatives, right? And then the ninth seat could be a guest judge every week, like on Top Chef. Yeah, yeah stick with me on this. That way it'll be a lot more fair and also, Everyone will be a lot more interested in the Supreme Court. Oh, Joaquin Phoenix is on this week. I wonder if he'll take away my health care. Oh, it's so exciting. And finally, voting is now underway in much of the United States. But if you live in California and you're planning to drop off your ballots at a collection box, you might want to read the fine print. Controversy in California after the Republican Party installed dozens of their own ballot drop-off boxes at several locations across the state. State officials calling them unofficial and illegal, though they appear virtually indistinguishable from the boxes sanctioned by the state. The California Republican Party not backing down, saying there are no laws that private drop-off boxes are not permitted. Whoa, 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 whoa the California GOP put out their own ballot drop-off boxes and labeled them as official? You know, that's shady as hell. You can't say something's official if it's not official. I hate it when people do that. You know, like how they say, Old Spice is the official deodorant of the NFL, but I've smelled Patrick Mahomes and he smells like sunshine, which last time I checked is not part of the Old Spice catalog. The deception aside though, I don't think ballot boxes on every corner is actually a bad idea. It should be this easy to vote in America. There should be drop boxes all over the place. You know, they, they should be like Starbucks. They should be everywhere. And they should also let you take a dump if you need to. Because otherwise the alternative is what we saw happening in Georgia just yesterday, where people were waiting in line for 11 hours just to vote. And let me tell you something. If I'm waiting 11 hours in line, shit, I don't wanna vote at the end of it. I wanna be president. By now, it is safe to say that the ongoing pandemic is driving a lot of people crazy. We're feeling cooped up, we're anxious. It's been months since we finally admitted that we don't like baking bread. But some people in Michigan have taken their frustrations a little too far. There is a new focus on the threat of radical militia groups in this country after the arrests of extremists accused of plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan. According to investigators, the so-called Wolverine Watchmen first plotted to storm the Michigan Capitol, then settled on kidnapping Governor Whitmer at her lakeside vacation home. One of those charged in the kidnapping plot rebelled against the pandemic rules on social media. Every single person that works for government is your enemy. Their main complaint seems to have been state restrictions imposed during the pandemic, especially the closing of gyms. God damn. These guys were apparently so mad about gyms being closed that they try to kidnap the governor. I mean, I get that it's frustrating to not be able to go to your gym, but I feel like on the list of solutions, kidnapping the governor should be below doing some push-ups. I mean, if you're upset about the gyms being closed, don't kidnap the governor. Kidnap a personal trainer. In fact, kidnap my personal trainer. He said tomorrow we're doing burpees, and I don't know what that means, but I'm scared. And can I just say, angry white dudes are truly on some other level. I mean, think about it. Flint, Michigan had dirty water that poisoned its own citizens for years, and those people stayed peaceful but these guys formed pale ISIS because they couldn't go to Planet Fitness? Now, unfortunately, this is hardly the first time we've heard about militias recently. They've been looming over protests and storming state houses since the early days of the pandemic. And I'm not gonna lie, this whole militia thing in America still blows my mind. I mean, when I first heard there was a group of young men who carry guns around and all dress alike, I thought, I mean, you can't fool me, that's, that's a gang. Right? It's a super white gang, but that's a gang. But my second thought was, usually you only hear about armed militias in countries like Afghanistan or Sudan, you know? So why is this something that is also going on in America? Well, let's find out why. 
in another installment of If You Don't Know, Now You Know. When you talk about militias in America, you have to start hundreds of years ago. Although back then, militias were a lot different than the ones we're seeing today. Well-regulated militias were actually quite important to the founders. They believed they were a bulwark against tyranny, and they were worried that the big, strong, new central government might crush these state military forces. So what they did is they said, we will have a militia. All able-bodied residents between certain ages are available to be called forth by the government in defense of the state. And once called forth, they answer to the government, they're trained by the government, they're directed and regulated by the government. The federal government was requiring everyone to be in the militia, but the state started to try to get around it in the early 19th century because it was so unpopular. So they created laws that said there is an organized militia and an unorganized militia. And anybody who wants to participate in the militia actively will be part of the organized militia. That later became the National Guard. This new arrangement, titled the Militia Act, will also be referred to as the Dick Law after its sponsor, U.S. Senator Charles Dick of Ohio. Yes, the Dick Law made a clear separation between organized and unorganized militias. And furthermore, None of you are even paying attention right now, are you? You're just thinking about dick law. You're sitting there giggling, thinking about dick law, huh? You're so immature. I'm trying to give you information, and now you're probably imagining it as a new law and order spinoff. Go ahead then, take your time. Ha ha, dick law. In fact, I'll show you a logo for the show, if this will move things along, okay? You happy now? Then then. The point I was trying to make is, like freedom of speech, and trash ass weaves, militias go back to the very beginning of America. Early America needed everyone to be ready to defend it at a moment's notice. You know, it was a different world with different needs. I mean, hell, Canada was a threat to America back then, which is wild. It's like finding out Mr. Rogers used to be a cage fighter. Whew, things have changed. But in today's age, militias are a lot like wiping your ass with leaves. They used to be all we had, but with all the progress society has made, if you're still doing that shit, you're probably a little crazy. And in fact, once militias were folded into the National Guard, unofficial militias sort of disappeared from America. Well, at least for a while. But in recent years, they started to reemerge in a much different and disturbing form. Armed paramilitary groups first got traction in the early 90s with high-profile clashes in Ruby Ridge, Idaho and Waco, Texas. Their numbers dropped after the Oklahoma City bombing, but they've been on the rise since President Obama took office. It is in part a reaction to the election of America's first black president. These groups start to expand very rapidly, I think largely in response to the idea that the United States is becoming less white. Well. You don't like blacks. You're racist and everything like that because he's a black president. No, I don't care what color he is. There's something not right about him. Militias grew nearly 800% during Obama's presidency as conspiracy theories, exaggerations, and rumors surfaced online and in the far-right media. They're gonna take your guns under the ruse of preventing war. There were fears that he'd try to stay in office indefinitely, that he was a socialist and a Muslim, even one wild rumor that he was going to invade Texas. Wow. Militias exploded once Obama became president? Well, well, well. We meet again, racism. I've been expecting you. It's almost like Obama became president and then the entire country locked its doors. And looking back on it, it's so funny that these guys thought Obama was gonna try and stay president forever and invade Texas? Because as soon as he could, Obama was out! Winning Oscars and kite surfing with Richard Branson. Uh, so long, uh, bitches. And you know, it's so weird how this stuff works. Because these people openly admit to every single conspiracy theory that they believe. But as soon as you ask them if it's because Obama is black, then all of a sudden they're like, what? Come on, man. No way. It's, it's that other thing that, that we don't like about him. Oh, what's that? Well, he's, he's, he's so tall. I mean, what is he doing up there? So, modern militias are not real military organizations. But what sets them apart from other violent gangs is that they tend to act as if they are. 
These people are incredibly dangerous. They're running around like a bunch of GI Joes, armed to the teeth. Groups of civilians who are creating military structures in their organizations, collecting and storing arms, ammunition. This is the Kill House. Move. Part of a training ground for a right-wing militia in the American South. This is for uh, conducting military operations in urban terrain. Um, we want to practice and rehearse moving up to these structures. You always want to be prepared for whatever could possibly come up. I'm training for uh, a type of event that uh, I will be wearing this 24-7. If getting off the couch and doing something is extreme, then yeah, I'm, I'm an extremist. Uh... I don't think it's the getting off the couch aspect that makes you an extremist. I mean, there's a lot of middle ground between getting off the couch and decapitating mannequins in the woods. Because that dude was purposefully describing the most benign part of what he was doing. It's like Hannibal Lecter saying, well, if setting the table and listening to classical music makes me a cannibal, then I guess I'm a cannibal. No, dude, it was the eating human liver part. You, you eat humans. Ah, yes, that too. <laughs> what I don't get about these militias is, that if you wanna dress in army fatigues and train for war, you can do that in the military and they'll pay you and they give you health care. This is like someone picking up strangers and then just driving them around a city for free. Oh man, join Uber, get yourself some of those stars. And look, it's clear that these dudes have a warped ideology. But a big part of this is just that these guys clearly need friends. They're lonely, they're scared of change, and this militia stuff gives them a sense of community. But because of toxic masculinity, the only way they can feel comfortable bonding is if it's based around violence. I just wish one day, one of them would just be like, hey guys, instead of spending all weekend canning beans and shitting in the woods, do you guys maybe just want to go out for brunch? Thank you. I thought I was the only one thinking that. I know a place that makes a great eggs Benedict. With three weeks to go until election day, and millions of votes already cost, coronavirus remains the top issue for America. And any normal president would be laser focused on getting corona under control, helping businesses stay afloat, keeping schools open. But Donald Trump is not a normal president. So instead, he's focusing on this. With weeks until the election and trailing in the polls, President Trump seized on a report in the New York Post published Wednesday claiming files and emails were taken from a laptop that allegedly previously belonged to Hunter Biden. The report alleges that the former vice president used his position to advance his son's business interests in Ukraine and that both Bidens were not truthful about that relationship. The story's sourcing has also raised questions about its authenticity as the files were given to the Post through an attorney for the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Twitter and Facebook have limited the distribution of that Hunter Biden story. And last night, Twitter appeared to suspend the Twitter account of White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany when she tried to share that story. Damn, you know a story is shady when Facebook is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe people shouldn't see this. Because think about it, usually people are posting about how vaccines did 9-11 and Facebook is like, okay, wait, wait, let's hear them out. Tell me more. And honestly, it's insane that Trump's people are even going off to Biden by targeting his son. Like if these were my sons, I'd maintain a strict kids are off limits policy. Look at them. They always look like they've done some shit wrong. And this should also go without saying, but obviously people should be skeptical of anything where Rudy Giuliani is the source. Right, just as a rule in life, never trust a man who dine and dashed on his dentist halfway through the job. You just don't trust those people. Now look, I'm not surprised that Rudy Giuliani is trying to come up with something before the election. I mean, I get it. What I am disappointed by is that the Trump campaign is using the same story. Really? Hacked Russian emails again? You're just gonna reuse the same October surprise as last election? It's called an October surprise, not an October. Hey, I know this one. It's not a surprise if we can see it coming. A surprise has to be an Surprise. But I gotta say, I don't think this plan to get people caring about the Burisma scandal is gonna work. Because who even knows what Burisma is? I mean, Trump himself can't even pronounce it. Eight months after his alleged meeting with the Burmese executives, 
So this uh, Burmusia, Burmusia, they say, pronounce it Burmusia. A real beautiful company. <laughs> oh man, that was painful to watch. You know what that looked like? That was like watching Trump's mouth trying to walk down a ramp. I mean, how does Trump not know how to say Burisma when that's all he's talked about for years? This should concern people. If Tony the Tiger was like, Frosted Flakes, they're grunk. You'd be like, I hope this guy's brain is okay. You okay, Tony? Yeah, I'm grump. The best part is, after Trump mispronounces the word, he then tells everyone that no, that's how you're actually supposed to pronounce it, which is the oldest playground move in the book. I totally meant to do that. That wasn't a mistake. Really, dude? You wanted your pants to split open so we could all see your Spider-Man undies? Yeah, that's how, that's how they say you do it on the internet. But you know what I say? Enjoy it while you can, people. Because Donald Trump is the Michael Jordan of mispronouncing words. We're gonna have to wait a whole nother generation to get someone messing up words at this level. Even then, I still think that Trump is gonna be the greatest of all time. You know, I'll be that old dude in the barbershop like, yeah, this young blood mispronounced the shit all right, but Donald Trump invented not making sense. Watch him try to say Burisma and tell me he's not the GOAT. Say Burisma, watch him say Burisma. Shit, you ain't never seen anybody mispronounce Burisma like that. But while we've heard Trump talk about Burisma and Hunter Biden a million times before, don't worry, he's still looking around for new material. In fact, he seems to have stumbled on one previously unreported issue that might just blow this election wide open. President Trump is now leaning into another fake conspiracy theory in an attempt to discredit former President Barack Obama. The Washington Post reports the president used his Twitter account to promote an absurd claim that Osama bin Laden wasn't killed by U.S. Special Forces in May 2011. President Trump alleges that the Obama administration killed Osama bin Laden's body double not the terrorist leader during SEAL Team 6's 2011 raid. Post says the president even retweeted an allegation that the Obama administration deliberately shot down a military helicopter with U.S. Navy SEALs as part of an elaborate cover-up. Yo, 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 yo. Now this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. None of this boring shit with Hunter Biden's email and Burismia. President Obama killed a secret bin Laden body double and then killed SEAL Team 6 to cover it up? and then he managed to keep it all quiet for eight years? Woo! Honestly, guys, if that's true, then I'm impressed because that sounds way harder to pull off than just killing bin Laden. To me, the best part of this conspiracy is that at some point, Obama had to hold auditions for a bin Laden body double to kill. You understand that's what this means, right? Thank you so much for giving me this part. Uh, I'm so excited. So is this for a TV series? Uh, actually, it's uh, more of a one-time thing. I also noticed there is no script. Uh, yeah, I'll, we're just gonna shoot a little thing. We'll just shoot something, see what happens. I'll also say this. If Trump loses this election, I think Twitter should hire him because they can find out what conspiracy accounts to suspend just based on what he retweets. Wow, this tweet says Obama started COVID to distract us from his wedding to Judge Soros. Great job, Mr. President. Suspend that account. You did it again. So look. America has a real decision to make in this election. I know that coronavirus has killed 215,000 people and is killing more every day, but just imagine how many Americans could be killed once Osama bin Laden teams up with Hunter Biden and Burma Mia. I think the choice is clear. Before we go, if you're registered to vote in this election, then it's very likely that you're eligible to vote early. So do it. Go to votevotevote.com to check your early voting options and make sure that you get your voice heard.